was 1972 when I walked into the College of Art to become a student in what is known now as the Crawford Art Gallery. Um, at that stage, um, the Crawford Art Gallery was combined, a kind of a, a hybrid of gallery and art school, which was fantastic for us students. But we were working in a gallery. The studios were located um, behind the gallery. The gallery sort of occupied the main foyer and the central core of the building. And most of the other rooms were studio spaces. So we were behind the scenes as students, if you like. My very first lesson was antique drawing. And the college then, you see the school, <clears throat> as it existed then, was really a 19th century structure. It, it, what was interesting was went into that kind of antique gallery, which still is existent today. And the difference is that the floor is level. When I was a student, the floor was not level. It kind of had a depression right in the middle. It was covered in mosaic because it was mosaic and it had this kind of funny depression. When you went into the antique gallery, it was like a bit surreal, really. Just inside the door to the left, um, there that was where I had my first uh, drawing lesson. And we had these kind of seats where you sit down and there's a little easel attached to the seat. It was kind of like slightly side saddle kind of scenario. Very quickly after, you know, just two weeks discovered that um, I was in the right building and I wanted to be a sculptor. I was very three-dimensionally orientated, um, intensely so. Um, and I think the, the double height studios, which were classic 19th century double height sculpture studios, were superb. Um, they would be now, if you go down towards the lecture theatre, there's a, a door on the left. If you go down into that corridor, there was a room on the right there and it was enormous. It pretty much nearly went right up the height of the building. So that space itself was just uh, enthralling. I think that probably when I did see the um, old warehouse that was to become the National Sculpture Factory, that again became something I was attracted to, having having had that experience of working in a room which was enormously high, you see. And this was the classic 19th century studio for sculptors, and I can completely understand why that's the case, because conceptually and in your thinking, you need that sort of freedom of space over your head, you know. So I've always had to have some double height element in my studio, I felt very much in my element there. It has this kind of hybrid sense of indoor-outdoor feel, you know. You feel liberated, you don't feel constrained by the roof, you know, there's a lot of that. I always loved the fact that the lecture theatre you could pull across, which you still can do on a hot summer day when you're in a lecture, pull across and open open the um, roof, there's a, there's a light there. The building itself, we just loved, we loved the building. We just loved that building and, you know, running up and down the stairs. And I mean, I used to run around the place. Yeah, I mean, a lot of running. In fact, there was kind of a thing like, you know, students were asked not to be running around the corridors, running. Imagine, <clears throat> there was this wonderful atmosphere. <laughs> you know? I mean, it's like fun. Then there was the under the stairs, which was like full of art. Like that samurai uniform that's um, outfit, I put that on once, mucking around in the storeroom and we used to find sort of like, because it was an eclectic mix of all sorts of things, um, drawings and stuffed animals and castings and like that suit. But one day I was in there and I saw all these drawings all around the floor and they were, um, they were um, Harry Clark's drawings. I didn't know Harry Clark existed. But they were very fine watercolours and <clears throat> I was like anxious about them. So I gathered them all up and uh, found a portfolio and put them in and bound them up and made sure that they were safe. And they're on exhibition there now, <laughs> in the, the Eve of St Agnes drawings. I mean, you know, there was a sort of, well, there, there just wasn't the kind of uh, restoration, it wasn't taken seriously then. Um, pretty much everything in the gallery stayed the way it was. And that was it. There was never any change. The current Opera House began its existence back in 1855 when, it, when the Athenaeum was built. 
Um, at that time, it was built as a lecture hall, a concert hall, and an assembly hall, and it was built here on M Place. Um, it was designed by Sir John Benson, and the building was actually a rebuild of the main exhibition hall at the 1852 National Exhibition in Cork. Um, so it was kind of the design, I suppose, was moved from the National Exhibition and up onto Emmet Place, and it was completed in 1855. Now, it opened with a series of, actually, funny, funnily enough, it unofficially opened with a series of local artists and musicians performing on stage which led up to its official opening on the 22nd of May, 1855. So until 1872, it was used for lectures, for balls, for cultural events. Um, but in the early 1870s, I suppose it was, began to become widely recognised that its use was limited. And um, there was a huge, huge demand for theatre at that time. Um, and it was remodelled at that point to provide more flexibility for performance. Now, not necessarily for theatre, um, because in 1872 it was reopened as the Munster Hall, but it continued to be used, I suppose, specifically for you know assembly places as opposed to any sort of theatrical reasons. Um, what happened subsequently in 1875 was that the Theatre Royal, which was the main centre for theatre in Cork, was actually closed, um, and f it then became that all of the focus of the, the theatre and entertainment in Cork was put onto the Munster Hall as Cork's only big large capacity performance venue. Um, following that, a new company was formed when the Theatre Royal and the Opera House Company purchased the Munster Hall and redesigned the building. When they redesigned the building, they added balconies, a gallery, a new stage, and these were all constructed to make it possible to hold big theatrical productions. The appetite for opera in Cork is phenomenal. When the Opera House was first built, um, it was you know, one of the only purpose-built opera houses in the country, it still remains as that, you know? I mean, we have the Wexford Opera House, which is a, re a relatively new building. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we have, ob obviously, there there's the, the Opera House in Belfast. But there is no other dedicated place to opera like the Cork yeah. Opera House, you know? Yeah, yeah. And the, what that has historically meant to the, to the audiences in Cork is that they've been consistently exposed to opera. You know, back in the 19th century, people would be like playing cards during performance. And I and I remember hearing that it was no, like in the late 1800s, like there was no hassle with, you know, if someone, if you didn't like the performer, they'd be like apples thrown onto the stage. And they like, you'd be told from the audience that, you know, you weren't doing a good enough job. And it was no, um, there was no shortage of people actually walking onto the stage to have a look at what was going on or going backstage to see, you know, it was a, like the formalities weren't as they are now. On the 12th of December 1955, I was playing a very important match in the Cork City Darts League at the Olympia in the lower road. I was a member of the darts team. My game had just finished when someone came into the pub and said that there was a big fire raging in town and looking up the lower road, I saw a great glow in the sky. It was pouring rain and gales were sweeping the area in what proved to be the most severe storm of the winter. I drove quickly up the lower road and along McCurtain Street. No one-way systems in those days. The glow getting brighter all the time. I was lucky to get a parking place in Bridge Street and from Patrick's Bridge witnessed the whole terrible scene as the final curtain fell on this magnificent old theatre across the lake. As the fire brigade arrived, the roof became a blazing inferno. Soon the backstage area, dressing rooms, makeup rooms and backstage bar were no more. Firemen made their way to the roof of the adjacent School of Art in Emmet Place, passing members of the City Vocational Education Committee, evacuating their building, and trained their hoses on the Opera House roof as best they could. But it was really in vain. Flames had spread across Half Moon Street at the rear of the theatre, as staff members frantically rescued huge rolls of paper and motor vehicles from the Cork Examiner garage. Sparks, carried by the gales, fell onto nearby roofs, but the heavy rain saved these buildings. Firemen directed their hoses on the back wall of the Opera House. A second unit of the fire brigade was called, but to no avail. By midnight, the once majestic theatre, opened in January 1855 as the Athenaeum, and becoming Cork Opera House in 1877 was but a smouldering ruin. 
Several firemen were injured, although none seriously, and they received speedy first aid treatment from members of the St John Ambulance Brigade before being taken to the North Infirmary across the river. At a subsequent meeting of Cork Corporation, a resolution was passed expressing sympathy to the manager and staff of the Cork Opera House on their great loss. The Lord Mayor, Alderman P. McGuire, TD, described the theatre as a famous old institution and a place of great associations with world-famous actors and actresses. He said that it would be hard, too, for the city to find alternative accommodation for the local groups that presented musical comedies, dramas and grand operas. It looked as if Cork would be at a severe disadvantage for some years, at least. In the event, it was several years before sufficient funds were raised mainly through the efforts of prominent Corkman Frank O'Leary, who marshalled the collection of voluntary contributions from the citizens. <laughs> 